What's up, guys? Today's episode is sponsored by Turn the Page Editing. Whether you are looking for an editor or a writer, they will help you with your latest endeavor as beautiful and well-written as possible. Turn the Page offers a number of services that include general editing and proofing, copywriting and editing, and manuscript editing and proofing, which I can speak personally is a lifesaver. Visit turnthepageediting.com to get started. Remember to put too many words in the subject line. Today's episode is also sponsored by LuLaRue. LuLaRue is a clothing company that provides comfortable, fashionable, and unique clothing for everyone. The famous soft, buttery leggings are only the beginning. LuLaRue also has an amazing line of women's dresses, skirts, tunics, and t-shirts. You will get 20% off your next order when you put too many words in the subject line. Go to Facebook dot com slash group slash Luluru Rebecca Clark VIP. All right, let's do the show. Hey guys, I'm Jamie Bedingfield and you are listening to my podcast, Too Many Words. As always, welcome and thank you for tuning in. I have one of my new favorite writers on the show today and I'm pretty stoked about it. Uh, Kate Howard is quite the wordsmith. I started reading her short stories, which you should definitely go check out. If you go to her site, you can find them there at cathowardbooks.com. But yeah, her stories led me to her recent release, Roses and Rot. Wow. I really love this book. It, uh, it, It hits home in some ways, but it also just mystified me. Um, It's one of those stories where every line is tight and beautiful and the story stays with you after you read it. Um, Yeah, so I will go to our chat shortly. I have a bit of business to tend to, but I will keep it short. Due to my inability to stop dissecting a character last night and horribly cliche dreams about being hired to hunt myself With my cat's need to eat at 3 o'clock in the morning, I did not sleep well. I am making gradual strides to rid my zombie persona as the day carries on. First off, I'm going to tell you all to go to the comic shop because there are awesome titles you should treat yourself to. I talked about Lady Castle last week. Delilah S. Dawson does an amazing job and it is officially out in stores, out from Boom Studios. Uh, Vertigo DC's Lucifer is now in Richard Cadry's hand. Issue 14 is fun and dark, and I love it. Uh, So it's worth the grab for sure. And, of course, if you aren't reading Monstrous, you should start. Marjorie Liu uh, is just writes an amazing story. She threw the moon, and uh, it's dark and enchanting, and I love it. So if you're not reading that, make that happen. Uh, Next week, I have Charlie Strauss on the show. Uh, Really looking forward to sharing that one with you guys. Really, he had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, Then after that, the show will be going on a hiatus for a bit while I bury myself in this massive rewrite. It was hard for me to decide to put the show on hold, but my mind needs to be fully focused. I will for sure um, post dates and details when I have them. I appreciate all your support and patience. And like I said, that would be short and sweet. Now to my talk with Kat Howard. to uh, quite a few writers who have just trouble sleeping and crazy dreams. Do you, do you fall on that at all? Yeah. Um, I'm somebody who has really vivid, um, dreams, uh, you know, and nightmares and sleep interruptions and all that kind of stuff, which is not really the most pleasant thing, you know, and I, I've tried to cut down on, on some of it by doing things like, you know, meditation and stuff like that to like calm down before bed. But some days that works better than others. Yes. I found that too. I, uh, I've been working yoga into my my day to day, just so that I'm not such a a ball of stress, especially at nighttime. It's like there's something about laying down that makes me want to not only have ideas, but also like critique things that don't need to be critiqued at three o'clock in the morning. (laughs) 
Very few things need to be critiqued at three o'clock in the morning, I find. Yeah, it's it's not the it's not the best mind working on the job, that's for sure. Yeah, I've also found um for me keeping a notebook by my bed. Um I used to use my phone and email notes to myself if I woke up with ideas, but then I would just get too caught up in the oh well I'm already emailing things, let's check the rest of my email. So if I just have a notebook and write things down, that's helped a lot. So you wake up and you're like, okay, yes, that's still a good idea. And sometimes you wake up and you're like, why did I write down 50 feet of penguins? <laughs> uh, but, you know, <laughs> at least you have it. <laughs> it's true, yes. You never know what will spark the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not penguins. You never know. There is, uh, people do like their penguins. That's true. So I uh, recently just finished reading Roses and Rot. And oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I have not related to a character that much in a really long time. So which of the characters did you relate to? I'm curious. Imogen. Okay. Um, I mean, a part of it is, the, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, she's a writer and there's a lot of, uh, you know, of thoughts that she has that I, I share. And also the fact that, like, you know, she has fear and stuff to work through. and uh, But also... I mean, reading her, uh, you know, the character of her mom is like my mother. So it was also, <laughs> yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, I was just super, super just like chugged through that thing because it was like speaking right to me and that's awesome. Well, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. I would imagine that that was, there was parts of that, that book that were difficult to get right. Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, there's a lot of experiences in there that are foreign to mine. Um, you know, one of one of the big ones for me, I actually, I'm fortunate enough that I have a very good relationship with my biological family and with my parents. And so, writing Imogen and Marin's mom, who is not at all a good person, was you know was a was a difficult thing for me, um, and and something that I wanted to be sure to get right um, as much as it meant you know putting that sort of pain and, and awkwardness and just general bad feeling on the page. Um, to a different extent, um, Marin's dance uh, was something that was really important for me to get right. I, you know, I took ballet lessons and stuff like that as a kid and I loved it, but I'm certainly not the kind of dancer that she is. Um, and so I talked to a lot of friends. I have a, an extremely good friend, my friend Megan, who's mentioned in the acknowledgments, who is a professional dancer and had her read for me and talked a lot um, to her about, you know, how to convey on the page what what dance would be like without making it seem, you know, silly or ridiculous or, you know, just trying to describe, you know, particular moves that people would just be like, what is even going on here? So, yeah, well, I would... Marin, I mean, uh, she's a very complicated character, so I would imagine that that would take uh, that would take some work. But yeah, it was you know it was really it was as as hard as you know as hard as some of the things were as unpleasant as some of the things were. It was also you know it's odd to say thinking back on it, but it was also really sort of interesting to spend time with these characters and with getting to know them as I put them on the page, um, and that was really. You know, that was really one of the most interesting parts of writing the book for me was figuring out who they were as people and how they would react to different things, um, making them seem seem real. I got to say that I'm I'm uh, I'm surprised to hear that you because I was reading the mom and I'm like, oh wow, I bet she's got to have mom issues <laughs> because <laughs> you know you're just you were hitting it right on. There's some things and even just like the. My favorite parts, you know, were just the casual mentions of like, oh, but with mom. And it's just like, it was, it was great. Yeah. You know, uh, um, I'm, I'm glad, you know, as, as awful as she is, I'm glad those parts rang true. That means I did my job correctly. Um, you know, I, one of my first jobs was as a gymnastics coach for a gym that turned out, you know, really top level competitive gymnasts. Um, and I had, you know, uh, my sister danced growing up. I've had friends who danced. And so you, you know, as an observer of, you see different kinds of parenting. You see some parenting where the parents are super supportive of their kids. They want what they, you know, what they want, what makes their kids happy. And then you see other kinds of parenting that's closer to Imogen and Marin's mom, you know, somebody who is trying to relive her own life 
what she didn't get, who doesn't actually care about what her children want, who cares about herself. You know, unfortunately, there are parents who are like that. And so, you know, drawing on things like that um, allowed me to, to put her on the page. I also drew, you know, specifically, this is a book that is in dialogue with a lot of different fairy tales. Um, and so some of it was just taking sort of the idea of, you know, the evil stepmother or the evil parent in a fairy tale and sort of just pushing on that and, and bringing that forward onto the page too, to make, to make that resonance clearer. The, your use of fairy tales is, is really interesting. And it, I really liked it a lot. I mean, in general, I, I love those stories that, you know, take fairy tales and do something different. And I wouldn't even say that you, you, it's definitely, I would say yours. And that's just, this is just from a reader. I don't know, um, you know, what your intentions were, but it's definitely reminiscent of fairy tales, but it's not like, it doesn't like hit you over the head with like certain things, at least in my opinion, it's like, it feels like it's just part of it rather than something you're trying to do. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, and that really was that, you know, that, that was what I was hoping for. You know, this is, Roses and Rot is very loosely based on uh, Tam Lin, which is a medieval Scottish ballad, which has sort of a lot of fairy tale qualities to it. Um, I don't know if we actually officially consider it a fairy tale or not. Um, probably not more than yes. You know, and so I wanted it to have, you know, if you're, if you're starting with a story about, you know, a fairy queen and her mortal lover and, you know, trying to figure out how to bring that forward and make it modern, you know, obviously thinking about different kinds of fairy stories is something that, that you're going to do. Um, and it made a lot of sense for me for, for fairy tales to have a resonance for Imogen because, you know, again, you go back to the trope of, you know, the evil stepmother and, you know, the, the people who, who get out of that through, through the course of the fairy tale. Um, and so I wanted it to feel like that the story was steeped in those, those fairy tales, that it was, that that was sort of a structure or a skeleton for what I was doing, but I didn't want it to be completely, I didn't want it to, to feel like a once upon a time and then they all lived happily ever after kind of story. I wanted to try and make it a, you know, um, in dialogue with that, but not a repeat. Yes. No, and you totally did that. And it was, it's refreshing because there, you know, there's definitely a lot of those stories where you're like, oh, okay, so this is, you know, Alice in Wonderland turned on its head and this is where this happens, but this happens instead. No, it wasn't like that at all. It's definitely like what you said, steeped in it. It's like, you know, you, you taste the lavender, but it's not overpowering. <laughs> you know, and, and also, I mean, part of it, I love fairy tales. I love fairy tales. I love fairy tale retellings. You know, one of the things, one of, I, you know, Terry Winling and Ellen Datlow's anthologies of fairy tale retellings that were a huge influence on me as a reader and I as a writer. I love those. Right? I mean, they're so good. Um, and it really, reading those really sort of broadened my mind into what you could do with a fairy tale structure, you know, and I've, I've done traditional fairy tale retellings on my own, um, there's an anthology out from Saga right now, The Starlit Wood, that I have a Snow Queen retelling in there. Um, oh, I'll have to check that out. That sounds awesome. Oh, it's uh, uh, Nava Wolf and Dominic Parisian are the editors. Um, and there's some great people in there. Kat Valenti, Naomi Novik, Max Gladstone, all sorts of just really, really great writers um, working with fairy tales. Um, my story reflected is the Snow Queen through theoretical physics. Um, I had a great time writing it. Wow. Yeah, I bet. That sounds fun. Um, yeah. So if you, know, if you are a fairy tale fan, I definitely... Um, you know, I definitely recommend it. I think there's, they did a good job of putting together a lot of different kinds of stories that will appeal to a lot of different people. So that's awesome. You know, I definitely will. I, uh, I find that I have to have like, I can't just, as far as like my reading, I need to have a novel and I need to have an anthology and I need to have either like, you know, a comic or a graphic novel. Cause I need to, I need to jump around. Oh, excellent. I love it. Comics are extra nice during coffee because I'm still waking up, so my mind. <laughs> there you go. You've got like a, just about enough brain space for 24 pages. Exactly, but I need to do something with my brain other than because if I just sit there on the sofa, I'll drift towards my phone and I'll be reading work emails, you know, before I need to be. Mm -hmm. So, and you've got a, a novel coming out, another one, um, on the unkindness of ma magicians. Yes, and Unkindness of Magicians is also from Saga. It'll be out um, in September of this year. 
Um, which now that I have said that out loud, it sounds very soon, even though this is only January. Um, it is not a sequel or a follow-up to Roses and Rot. Roses and Rot is meant to be a complete standalone, um, as is Unkindness of Magicians. Um, it's uh, Unkindness is social climbing magicians in modern New York City um, who duel each other with magic um, for social status. Um, How cool. I had a lot of fun writing it. I wanted to do something very different from Roses and Rot, and so we will see if I have managed to pull that off. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it was a lot of fun. You have a whole bunch of short stories that have been published. Do you find that all your short work, your short fiction work, helps you like write a tighter novel? I don't know if I would say it helps me write a tighter novel. Um, I think they're two really different skills. Okay. Uh, writing short stories and, and writing novels. I think you can find people who do both very well. Um, I think you can also find people who are very good at one or the other. Um, and I know that the, the advice for people who wanted to write, especially people who wanted to write in genre fiction, used to be, you know, start out with short stories and see what happens. And I think if you love writing short stories, there's a lot of good reasons to write them. Um, I think... I feel like when I write short fiction, the fact that it is short gives me freedom to do different things. It gives me freedom to, for example, write something in second person. Um, I feel like readers will put up with second person for two, three thousand words in a way they would possibly not put up with for 90,000 words. Do you know what I mean? Totally. <laughs> you know, I feel like it, it gives you a chance to be more experimental with your language, to try different things. And I think any skill that you learn in working on your short fiction how to set a scene, um, how to do good dialogue, how to introduce a character, you know, how to maintain a plot thread. All of those things are things that can carry over into novel writing. But if you want to write novels, start out by trying to write novels. There's no reason in terms of craft necessarily to start out by writing. Totally. Um, well, and that's something I find in general is it's really easy like to be away from said work, thinking about how you're going to tackle it when in reality, it's when you're actually tackling it. Do you kind of figure that out? I mean, ideas and stuff need to stew, but it's mm -hmm. like so often um, I'll sit down to do something, you know, to work on a particular thing and I end up working on something entirely different because that's how my mind is and I think you know and I think a lot of it I think a lot of it is learning to figure out what kind of process works for you are you somebody who who back brains a project for a long time so that for you starting writing might look a lot like you know taking walks around your neighborhood or cleaning your apartment or baking cookies or stuff like that because as you're doing all those things your brain is working and working and working and then you sit down and you do a lot of words in a very concentrated burst because you've already done all the work in your head for a while um for other people you know for me i know writing looks a lot like sitting down and putting some words on the page and then scratching those words out and then putting some more words on the page and then maybe scratching those words out too and then stopping and making a chart because i have forgotten to put the plot in the story um you know and then coming back you know and it and, and when i was first starting out writing i was really convinced that there had to be a right way to do it you know like if i just did thing x and thing y and thing z then i would be great and I would know how to write and everything would work and everything would be easy and that is just not the case yep. um, you know it's very much what works for one writer doesn't necessarily work for all writers and even what works for one project doesn't necessarily work for all projects you know the writing one book and writing the next book can be two completely different processes and learning to accept that and live with it and kind of relax and trust myself as a writer has really really helped so that's something that I'm uh, I'm aware that I need to work on, but it's definitely a process. It's like there's this fine line between um, trusting my instincts and then like doubting them, being like, no, this is just like the unconstructive voice that's talking, not the actual gut that's telling me, no, this needs to be different because the way it is is garbage. <laughs> and I think I think what you just said, you know, there's a difference between the unconstructive voice or the internal editor or you know our internal critic. And then your actual gut as a writer and, you know, and learning to recognize those, learning to recognize when it's, when it is that doubt and maybe you need to get up then and do something else, mm -hmm. and, you know, reread something that you love and that inspires you or clear your head somehow. 
um, is a lot different than when you have that feeling of no, really something isn't right here. Something is missing from this story. I've made a wrong turn. And then you can sort of, you know, go back and look at the choices that you've made and look forward at the choices that you want to make with that, you know, short story or novel or whatever it is you're working on and pull yourself back to making that make sense and, and making that better. And again, it's really, there isn't one right or wrong way to do it. It is whatever, whatever gets your words on the page and whatever gets you through that project. Yes. And sometimes just finding what those things are is a, it's a process all of its own. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So how long have you been, have how long have you been at this? Um, I started writing seriously about eight years ago. Okay. I wasn't one of those people who knew from the time they were little that they wanted to write and all they wanted to do was write. Um, and you know, it was just, it was a, it was a choice that I made when things, everything kind of felt like it got crazy. And I was like, well, I think I kind of want to do this. I'm going to give it a try and I'm going to see if I can. Um, thankfully I was able to do that. Um, but I still feel like, I still feel like I'm in a, a learning part of my career and, you know, maybe I'll always be in that partly, but I still feel like I'm, you know, figuring out how I work and what kind of stories that I want to tell and, you know, what kind of things that I want to do and how, how to work best. Mm-hmm. You know, and at this point, I feel like I have some instincts and I can, you know, I can trust myself on certain things and, and that has helped a lot. But, you know, I definitely still want to push myself to do new and different kinds of projects and, and, and different kinds of work. Well, and it's it's a really interesting balance because of the fact that for so long what you're working on, it's just so abstract. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually I was actually just thinking about this today getting ready for this interview because it was, you know, the way publishing and stuff works. It was about three years ago that I had the first bad draft of Roses and Rot finished, like almost exactly three years ago. Oh wow. Um, yeah, and then I sat down and like, you know, did a massive, you know, basically took time off from almost everything else that I could possibly take time off from and sat down and just did a I deleted all but about 10,000 words of the original draft in one fell swoop and did a massive, massive rewrite. Wow. Um, in about, yeah, yeah. Um, that was, that was tough, but I'm glad I did it. I had a much better project. Um, but yeah, this is, this is about that time of year. And it was, it was about, about three years ago. And it's just really weird to think about that and think about the way the time passes. I can spend so much time wandering, just like letting my mind wander about time. Because it's like there's certain <laughs> things that like pop up. Like you said, like this is the time of year three years ago that you, you know, there's things like that all the time, whether it's like, oh, wow, my cat's going to be seven. Or <laughs> it's like, you know, you stop and you think about the time that's passed and you're like, wow. But there's like certain moments where it's like you're waiting for the next thing or like, you know, every phase feels like forever. But then when you're separated from it and you look back, it's like, yeah, time, it, it, it moves. Yeah. It's crazy. A lot of things you look back and like, I can't believe it was that long ago. And also it was only that short of a time at the same time. Do you find that like working on multiple, like multiple projects, being able, at least having like multiple things going on. So when you're at that wait phase with something else, you have something to to jump to I I am very much a person ever since I started I, I started writing seriously while I was still still finishing my dissertation um so I sort of I started out writing by learning how to juggle multiple projects um and it's still something that I generally do because that way I feel like if you know if I've got something that I'm you know back braining and something that I'm actively working on first drafting and maybe something that I'm researching like having those to turn to if I feel like I'm getting stuck somewhere or I'm not quite sure what happens next on something then I have something else to, to look at that I can be working on and a lot of times just turning to something else for a while will clear up that sort of mental blockage about whatever other project that I was stuck on but yeah I mean as you said with the waiting publishing is a ton of hurry up and wait yes um, and so, yeah, having, having something new that I'm working on, having something that's in progress while I'm waiting for news on something else. Um, it's a, for me, it's a really good way to feel like, well, at least I'm in control of this thing that I'm working on right now. At least no one else, you know, I'm not waiting on someone else to get back to me about this. This is something, you know, that I've got, that I've got under control. Um, pretty much the only time that I'm not working on multiple projects is when, 
I'm really close to, you know, finishing a draft or finishing a revision. When I, and so the only thing that's in my head at that point is the, the main project that I'm working on. Yeah. Well, and that's, uh, I uh, had a, I need to do that too. And also part of it is just alleviating anxiety. So it's like, okay, well, this thing needs to sit and I'm waiting to hear back on this other thing. Well, I would go nuts if I didn't have something to work. I definitely have to do that. But then in uh, the fall, I learned, okay, well, I am just heads down on this one thing. I'm not able to focus on everything else. So I need to go ahead and like push things back so I can just put my brain on this. Yeah. And again, I think it's, it's another one of those things that varies from project to project. There are some things that are really easy to, to transfer back and forth in between. And sometimes you do, you need to stop and just say, okay, this for right now, this story is the one thing that I'm focusing on. Um, so now do you have, I, I know you have publication dates coming up. Do you have stuff in the works right now that you're, that you're working on? Um, so yeah, publication dates that are known. Um, I have, uh, as I said, Unkindness of Magicians comes out in September. Um, I'm also contracted for a short fiction collection, um, a cathedral of myth and bone, um, which will be out in early 2018. I don't have a more specific date. Um, on that and that is a that's something that I'm currently it'll be some some previously published works and then some new things and I'm currently working on the last of the new things um, for that collection oh nice um, is there is there a theme to yeah um, I'm actually it's a, a couple things that I tend to talk about a lot in my work um, it, one is myth I do a lot of like with fairy tales I do a lot of work with with myth and sort of retold myth. Um, and so that will be part of it. Um, I've got a, one of the pieces in there is an Arthurian retelling um, novella length called One's Future. That That's a new one, and I'm really excited for people to read that. Um, the other part of that, the cathedral part, um, is uh, stories about faith and belief. Very so, cool. Yeah, so it's not meant to be, you know, like a greatest hits or a most popular stories. It's meant to be stories that fit with those themes. Um, so once I get this last new piece finished, then I'll sort of sort through and put things together in a way that'll match up um, with those themes. And um, and then my editor and I will make it all shiny and nice for everyone. That's awesome. Well, that's a lot of exciting stuff. You must be excited. I am. I really am. It's, it's, it's great, you know, and... Oh, uh, that will also be out through Saga Press. And um, I'm, you know, my editor, Joe Monty, is great um, and is, you know, has been really supportive of me and the work that I'm doing. And I've been very, very lucky to work with him and with Saga. That's awesome. It's got to feel good to know that you've got you've got those coming out. It, it does. It feels good. It also, it's, you know, that time thing that you mentioned before, it's very weird. It's like, Oh, okay. And so I, I have this and I, you know, friends ask when are things coming out? And I'm like, well, you know, early next year. And they're like, that's a long time. And then I'm like in publishing time. I'm like, no, that's very soon. Yeah. No. Um, when you said <laughs> September for uh, magicians, I was surprised. I hadn't realized it was that soon either. I had seen a, a tweet about it I guess a few weeks ago but I didn't put um a date in mind and that is that is soon I'm looking forward to that one thank you thank you yeah the um tour.com did the cover reveal for us and the cover is amazing I am still pinching myself with how lucky I am uh with that Saga's art director Lizzie Bromley is is great and did just such a wonderful job with it so. Yeah, that cover does rock. I would be thrilled if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of like made this high pitched squeak when it came across my email. Like, <laughs> 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 nice, genuine glee. Yeah. Do you have? Are you do? Are you going to any conventions or anything in the next year to kind of get the word out there? Or what kind of touring do you have? Um, at this point, I don't have any set event dates for this next year. Um, I'm sure there will be later, but um, I've been, you know, taking some time to actually sit down and be quiet and write for a while um, rather than travel and do conventions. So that's totally. <laughs> so that's sort of the plan right now. But like I said, I'm, I'm sure there will definitely be some, and I will be happy to let people know when that happens. What do you think, like, you know, if, and this is probably something that, you know, this changes with project and also just, you know, pure experience, you know, the further you, you know, you get into it, I'm sure it changes, but like, 
as of like, you know, what currently, what is, would you say one of the biggest challenges, like writery challenges that you're dealing with? Um, right now for me, one of the biggest challenges is, is to do that turning off of my internal editor when I'm working, especially when I'm drafting. Um, I am, I really like revision. I'm really good at revision. Um, I am not good at initial drafts. Um, and a lot of that is because I'm at, I feel like I'm at this place where I'm just good enough to know where the flaws are in that draft. And that's not a helpful thing to do to yourself, you know? And so a lot of, a lot of getting through the first drafts for me are just stopping and pausing and saying, you can fix it in revision. Just get something on the page now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so doing that and moving on, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I am very envious of people who are clean, quick first draft writers, because that is not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is not me either but I would say with me like drafting that's like you know if I'm with this last big thing that I drafted it came out and I didn't have that that issue where I was like just let it come out it came out now it's going back and figuring out like what it is without like you know the chicken little part of me that's like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, to balance that out, you know, at least, at, at least at this point, I do know that I can fix it in revision. You know, I do know that, you know, once I get something there that I can look at it. And even if I wind up, you know, like I said, with roses and rot, I cut a whole bunch of words all at once after that first draft. And I figure at this point, if I can get through doing that, like I'm good, it was hard. It wasn't fun, but I can make a completed thing that I'm proud of at the end. And that's actually what matters. You know, I, I work with, writers um I do sort of developmental editing with them and one of the things that I say and one of the things that I would tell my students when I taught there is no prize for the fewest number of drafts you know, <laughs> I like is, that you know nobody's going to see that initial thing unless you want them to the only thing they're going to see is what you publish at the end so as long as that's something that you're happy with it doesn't really matter how you get there you know just give yourself the space to get to that point well, it's hard because there's just, there is really like, you know, there's just so many possibilities. There's so many ways to take things. And like, that's right now, like, as far as like this morning, my brain is just like, I don't, I don't know what, you know, what the right thing is. I just know that it's not right the way it is. But I figure, you know, even if you figure that part out, even if you figure out that what's there isn't right, then at least you've done that work, you know? You, I like you, that figured that out and then you can say okay no and you can take the pieces that maybe were you can take the the bits that do still you know click in your head or have resonance for you you can pull those out and you can move on you know and and sometimes you do have to write the wrong thing to know what the right thing is and that's fine well just like ideas there's some ideas where it's like you have this initial idea and that oh, that idea's only purpose is to lead you to this other idea but sometimes exactly. at that moment you don't realize that yeah. Kind of like the Cheshire cat. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Roses and Rot. As mm -hmm. far as Imogen, now, did you, like, were you just kind of discovering her and her sister? And is that how, like, the world kind of came in around her? As well as, like, you know, that was the kind of mother that they had? Or, you know, the whole story just folds together so nicely. So I'm just like, you know, as I was reading it, I was trying to like, you know, because that's what I do when I read books is I try to figure out like, you know, like, okay, like, so, you know, what, how did like kind of, Im was it, Im what initial like character or idea kind of opened the door for, for that? If, if there is just one, there might not be. The, the initial idea was actually wanting to tell a sort of Tamlin story. Um, like it's a Tamlin, it's a, it's a medieval Scottish ballad. It's great. Um, there's actually uh, Pamela Dean's Tamlin is a wonderful, wonderful book that I highly recommend to everyone. Um, I'm writing the name down right now because I, I haven't read it. I'm unfamiliar. Oh gosh, it's such a treat. It's beautiful. Um, but in the initial ballad, so part of what the ballad is, there's, there is Janet who, okay, there's the Queen of Fairy who takes a mortal lover, um, Thomas, Tamlin. 
because he is adorable and he is hot and all the ladies want him. Um, and he's sort of a player and he goes, you know, the queen of fairy is like, come with me. I'm going to change your life. It's going to be awesome. And so he goes away to fairy and then that's great. Except when he's not in fairy, he meets Janet and falls in love with her. Um, and also gets her pregnant. Um, and you know, 15th century birth control being not quite up to modern standards. (laughs) Um, and the Queen of Fairy is like, well, that's not good. I don't really appreciate that. Um, and the catch is, is that every seven years, a fairy pays a tithe to hell. Um, and so she, did, the queen, the queen decides that she's going to send Tam Lin because you know she's pissed at him now for you know running around on her with this mortal girl. Um, and Janet decides to save him from hell. Um, and it's much more complicated. I'm giving like the three second, you know, even shorter than Cliff's Notes version. Um, but one of the things that really struck me when I was reading the ballad was, okay, you love someone enough that you are literally going to stand in front of hell and keep them out of there. That is a really powerful love. And it's a love, you know, we see romantic love all the time. Um, but I really wanted to, you know, I, I have a sister, Rose and Ra is dedicated to her. She is my best friend. I love her so much. Um, and so when I was thinking of, okay, who, who, who would I, you know, who would I stand in front of hell for, you know, I was like, well, obviously my sister. And so I knew that I wanted to tell this story and I knew that I wanted to tell this story with a pair of sisters at the center of it. Um, and that's sort of where that, you know, and then I had Imogen and I had Marin. Um, and that's sort of where the book started. Everything else came from wanting to tell the story of, you know, of, of the complicated relationship between sisters who loved each other very much. Um, and yet would still, you know, get into this situation where one would have to pull the other back. That's awesome. And I'm definitely going to check out uh, Tamlin because I'm very, I'm not familiar at all. And I'm, you've definitely piqued my interest. It was one of those books. I found it, you know, it was, you know, found it in the library when I was, uh, when I was in high school and then bought my own copy. And then like every time I moved, like every time I went off to school, every time I, you know, changed everywhere, you know, even in places where all I could bring was like one tiny little box of books. That was one of the books that went with me just because I loved it so much. That's Awesome. Yeah, those books. Moby Dick is that for me. It was a book that I stumbled on when I was probably too young to really appreciate it the first time. But one thing that I was able to pick up, reaching for your dreams, getting out of, you know, getting away from things that, you know, don't make you happy, don't make you feel good, reaching for something else. And that was just like, that was a book that I just kept with me and kept going back to it. Because it was. I love that. Yeah. Well, uh, Kat, can you tell everybody where they can um, find you and you know, your books and also um, your editing service? Um, absolutely. Um, I have a website, uh, Kat Howard Books, um, and that also includes links to um, being able to find some of my short stories um, and also buy links for Roses and Rot. Um, I also have a novella um, co-written with Maria Devana Headley called The End of the Sentence um, that was published by Subterranean Press. And you can find information on that there too. Awesome. Um, it's uh, it, it, If you like your stories a little bit darker, it's definitely horror. Um, but that was a lot of fun to write. Um, and so all information on my writing is there. Um, and you can also find information on my editing services there I am currently as of today accepting clients again too so please get in touch if you're interested um you can also find me if you would like a quicker uh, interaction I am on twitter um cat with sword and I am always happy to talk to people there awesome well cat thanks so much for taking the time and coming on it was a lot of fun talking to you this was a lot of fun thank you so much for having me And that wraps it up for this week, guys. Thanks for tuning in and listening and all that stuff. Uh, Tune in next week for my episode with Charlie Strauss. And uh, for all my stuff, my words, and where to find me, you can go to my site, jamiebeddingfield.com. Talk to you next week. (laughs) 